Welcome, everybody, to number three of our eight Japan Saki and Shochu Lakers Association webinars, all about Shochu. And this webinar, all about adaptability. There has never been a year in which adaptability is more important than it is this year. So joining us live from Sydney, we have the multiple, multiple award-winning Mike Enright of the Barber Shop, his protege, Kellum Waterfield of the Duke of Clarence. In one uh, Zoom window, we've got both Gracie Peters of Picaleo and the amazing and currently freelance Jenna Hemsworth. In another window, we have Mike's old colleague and storied Australian bartender, late of the Manhattan Bar Singapore, Mr. David Nguyen Liu, and his protege, Alson Tian, joining us live from Singapore. My name is Philip Duff. The Chochu's got an extremely long history in Japan, but if you've only come to Chochu recently, believe it or not, a lot of Japanese people only came to show to you recently, much like a lot of spirits. There was sort of a renaissance and a rediscovery of what shochu is among Japanese people about 20 years ago. It went from being a blue collar spirit to being something that people paid good money for and sipped and enjoyed and learned about the history. So, Chikako, are we able to show the uh, shochu 101 now? Because if we can't get it up, what we'll do is we're going to skip right over to uh, Gracie and Jenna and ask them to make their cocktails. And we'll show the Shochu 101 like after that. Gracie, uh, Jenna, are you ready to kick us off here with a couple of cocktails? Let's make a cocktail. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, I'll go. Um, I'll start with like I've got one's uh, a bit more of an aperitif style, one's a bit digestive style. Uh, so obviously, start to finish is always best. Uh, I've kind of based it upon drinking trends in Australia. Um, we had a good chat about, you know, where everyone is in Sydney or at Australia in general, um, as shochu is something that is very new to us. Um, it's, it was completely foreign to me until going to Japan. Uh, and now it's something that, cause it's such a, when you get to see something produced from start to finish, uh, you do feel a little bit of that ownership of like you want to share that with other people. Uh, so, you know, trying to get people into that and, you know, just bringing it more into our, our spirit vocabulary is um, something that we're excited to, you know, start doing a bit more of. So let me try to get my stand awkwardly spot as I make this, so I'm in frame. <laughs> Um, but the first one is just a simple, I'm lunging if you can't see, uh, the first one is a simple built cocktail and it's a Saiten spritz, so it's light, spritzy um, and low alcohol because um, a massive trend I think not just in Australia but everywhere is people drinking more high quality drinks and less of them, uh, so more quality over quantity uh, and again, as you said, it's very hot here currently, yesterday we had a uh, a 42 degrees Celsius day, so very hot. Uh, so drinking as well, like trends are so weather dependent. Uh, I think this is something that's a bit perfect for hot weather, low alcohol, spritzy, easy. Uh, so my lovely pre filled with ice highball, if you can see that, amazing. Uh, I'm using, again, we don't have that many shochu brands available in Australia yet, uh, but one that is, is the Ichiko Saiten, so a barley shochu, uh, and this one was made especially for mixing with cocktails. So it does sit at 43% there, so like on the real upper end of the, uh, as you'll learn, the allowances of percentage for shochu. Uh, so again, I'm only going to use 30 mils of this single shot in there, one ounce. Uh, in that because as I said we don't uh, this is an aperitif as well we wanted to do the job but not get you out of the game essentially just yet uh, so I have added where is my so I'm sorry I made Campari with uh, Davidson plum in it uh, and then I brought the not infused one so when I say it's infused just use your imagination this How long did you infuse it? Did you just cut the plums up and put them in? 
But David Plum just comes in, this is just regular campari for this recipe, but the second recipe will use the infused one. Uh, you find it freeze dried. The Davidson plum is the season quite short uh, and it's like a powder. It essentially leaches out so quickly into alcohol that you just put it in, leave it and shake it for a little bit and strain it out. And you've got this beautiful, rich, fruity, stone fruit flavoring that goes so well with the shochu because of those beautiful, nutty, fruity stone fruit notes of it. Uh, it's just so versatile and it's really popular or it's becoming more popular as oh, an being really popular to use. 10 mils of some lemon juice in here, just to, you know, thicken that one up. Uh, and then the main attraction here besides the shochu is a grapefruit uh, soda that I've made. So essentially just carbonated grapefruit juice. Yep, carbonated it. Uh, <laughs> with some sage, some black peppercorns, pink peppercorns, and uh, grapefruit skins as well. Um, so that's just popping that one up there. Again, super simple, so you can just build that and it's a nice, easy one to make at home if you have access to all of these ingredients. Uh, and just because I wanted it to be beautiful and pretty as well, I've garnished with a jasmine flower, which seem to only flower when they when and when they want to. So once a week for, a month, uh, for the year. It's got a beautiful little highball spritz there uh, and the nice floral, uh, like, smells nice. Say it smells nice. It does smell nice. Yeah, see? <laughs> uh, it's just a beautiful, nice, refreshing drink. And that floral note on the top is really going to complement everything in there. Uh, and everything's working together to make that shochu the hero there. Uh, but it being a barley shochu as well, it's a bit milder in flavour. Again, so it will, you know, take a bit more of addition of flavours to it. Uh, so that's our, our first drinky there. That's, that's uh, it's sort of a, a multifaceted Collins, you know. You've got, like, nice, yeah. ingredients. Very, very easy drinkable to introduce people to shochu, I believe. Exactly. We don't want to scare them off just yet, you know. <laughs> uh, as with any spirit or anything in general, like, you know, in introducing yourself slowly, uh, maybe equating it to things because shochu is such a unique spirit in and of itself, uh, introducing them into something that they can equate it to. If you're putting it in a columns going, okay, it's not gin by any means or form, but if you're putting it in a a known recipe that you can go, oh, okay, I can make that connection between Collins and this cocktail here. Uh, it's a bit easier than, you know, the straight up, you know, Mizawari, like, <laughs> show you on water. Well, shout out to all the people that have just joined us. Paula Lucas, Justin Potts, I see you. Asako, Moses, welcome. Uh, do you want to make your second drink now, Jenna? Or Gracie, do you want to jump in and make one? What's the best flow here? Um, we're all ready to go. Uh, do you want to shake, shake, well. shake yours? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Be loud. So as Jenna touched on previously, I think, oh, yeah, you got to lunch. lunch. <laughs> um, we've seen that definitely more low ABV, somewhat bitter drinks coming to the forefront of Australian drinking. Um, it could just be a, uh, a, sorry, I'm just going to rinse this. Um, Thing because of COVID, a lot of people were inside, um, didn't want to drink that much, but still wanted to feel <laughs> that like was not my experience. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I've done is I've taken, it's still too high, um, the Ichiko, and I am adding 30 mils. Uh, 20 mils of citrus. I tried. You did a good job. <laughs> and um, a grapefruit and blood orange cordial that I made, just really getting back to the refreshing bitter for drinks. Yeah, it's like the, the new um, citrus and sweet is citrusy and bitter is what people are asking for now. Apparently. Really? Yeah, definitely. Like I, especially perhaps because I am now working in more of a restaurant setting, um, Americanos and Negronis are really, um, I guess, being asked for more often. And also, Australia's got this insane, amazing coffee culture. 
and people are getting used to bitter flavors more i feel yeah, yeah. definitely and you know like, we work in bars and i guess i think bartenders really seem to enjoy those flavors more so but i think it, the general public is really catching on to that um cracker and as well i guess <laughs> So just a quick shake, um, I didn't add any sugar because the way that I made the cordial, which I think uh, we sent the recipe to you to be published, actually it has sugar in it. So, is that anything, Nora? And it's a, a light, easy drink. So not too sweet, not too citrusy. The sochu is a really great um, base for this drink because it's got a bit of complexity. Uh, it really comes through. Again, it's a it's a super what, tried and tested recipe. Sweet, like a sweet sour dak dakery. Picked up. Let's, yeah. Let's not be so backwards. That is a sexy looking drink. It is. I hope so. <laughs> right? You send out one of those. I mean, it's not blue, but that is an attractive drink. I guess I could make it blue. Yes. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, and uh, that's another thing. What something that I've really noticed the um the appearance of a drink almost matters more. At, you know, like I'm working in a, di a different, I guess, demographic to like my previous bartending experience and more in the city, in a restaurant setting. And it's more office workers as opposed to bartenders. Um, and the appearance of the drink really seems to be what people go for and say, well, I want that one. Um, and then I guess that because of that, they get to try new things. I'm not sure if that makes sense. It really does. If you think at the highest level of cocktail bars doing really esoteric things like um, Luke does at Birdie or Nightjar in London or Ariel, they have these incredible presentations that made people say, I want that. And it pushes them to try things they would never have ordered. Yeah, and that's something that I definitely... Um... I guess first learned when I was at Scout when they were here in Sydney when so I worked there for a while and it was quite evident that the appearance of a drink along with the flavor but not really um not explaining every um iota of the ingredients but more saying this is bitter this is refreshing this is you no know, sour yeah if you like biggest... this you might like to try yeah. this kind of thing so that's that's our job, isn't it? To to educate people in that respect without kind of forcing things upon them. Um, but yeah, my experiences with Scout in, as well were very. You feel in safe hands to try something left of center, which is yeah. And I think most more more and more people are trusting their bartenders to come up with something out of the box, which is why I think Shochu could. Um, definitely have more of a public uh, standing um, as it's going to be glasses. huge. It's going to be massive. <laughs> I mean, let's bear in uh, mind, Japanese people drink more of it than sake, which is a statistic that continues to blow my mind. All right, so <laughs> what we're going to do is I'm going to sort of uh, do the, the Shochu 101 live, but before we go over to that, um, Jenna, do you have another cocktail you're going to make? Yeah, I'll breeze through this one quickly. It's just oh, uh, yeah. We'd love to see it. A Negroni riff. It's really, really simple. Um, this is one I was lucky to pick up in Japan, the, the Kinjo Shiro here. Ah, uh, excellent. Rice-based and uh, with the white koji. So, again, it might not make sense if we're learning white. That's uh, my calling card for using this one in an after-dinner style. And it is also aged in... Uh, we had white oak, whiskey, and sherry barrels, if I'm not mistaken, mm. uh, which, again, 
I would like to use that in this kind of more after dinner style cocktail, uh, just because of that, it, it, it can, you could draw those comparisons between that and uh, an aged spirit that you might be more familiar with. Definitely, so a lot of those uh, barrels are Canadian that they use actually. Oh really? Ah. Uh, so this one, if we use our imagination, is our Davidson Plum Infused Campari. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I've got uh, Australian, as you said, with our amazing coffee culture, uh, the Mr. Black here made not too far down the road from us, um, <laughs> literally just like an hour away from, from where we are. Uh, again, one of Australia's most, again, it's booming worldwide now, this uh, liqueur. And it's, it's an amazing stuff. coffee liqueur uh, and it's so versatile as well that it just fits right in with this. Uh, and you're getting that really fullness of body from it, which is complementing that aged chochu. Uh, so again, just equal parts of that. I use a little bit less of the coffee because it is a liqueur and it can be a bit overpowering. Um, but again, Boulevardier Negroni backbone style, just a little after dinner sipper there for you. So that's, um, that's very simple, that one there. It, it occurred to me that funky plum Negroni sounds very much like funky cold Medina. But that's only for the viewers. <laughs> Cheers, thank you. Oh, brilliant. So just a couple of questions. Gracie, I know the show to you is relatively new for you. And one of the questions I want to ask is, obviously you study a lot of different categories of spirits. How useful are the traditional templates of you know, spirits, fermenting, distilling, when you learn about chochu? Is it a totally different animal or can you slot it in? into something familiar? Um, I think it is in its own way, a different animal, but there are, ooh, there are aspects that you can take from different, um, well, a lot of my background is in whiskey and the laws surrounding, you know, whiskey production and the barrels that you can use and the laws about, you know, the percentages or like the maximum distilled percentage and the aging processes. So I found the, cause it's not a very long aging process for the majority of shochu is what I kind of got. So I could, um, I found the tequila aging more useful there. And then the laws surrounding scotch distilling, but also the versatility of how you can distill shochu from many things. And I'm not sure if I even, you know, understand everything cause you know, it's some Places have said carrots and sesame seeds, which um, that was something that I found really interesting is that it really seems to be diverse. And then obviously the type of koji used has a massive um, impact onto the flavor that I guess. Does. Oh, it's bananas, Gracie. Like one of the best <laughs> um, trivial pursuit questions to win an argument with is you're actually not allowed to age shochu in barrels so that it gets uh, too dark. You wow. actually have to arrest aging before the color gets too dark. Otherwise all the Japanese whiskey producers get pissed off. Yeah, so well, <laughs> I'm not sure if this was right, but I read that um, a lot of, like most of the aging process that does happen is like, uh, similar to most other whis uh, whiskies, in order to avoid massive angel share, is done in dark, temperature controlled environments uh, caves. as well. Caves, much, yeah. tunnels. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Exactly. So, Jenna, on to you. I mean, obviously, you're an expert because you've been to Japan and you were my karaoke buddy. But as the person, <laughs> you know, within your friend group, your professional group, you know, who has been there and seen it, what's the elevator pitch? How do you explain shochu to someone who's never had it, doesn't know what it is? Uh, so essentially this is what you guys did for me last year when I was lucky enough to go see it firsthand. Uh, it was a very, it was, it was a, a concept that I had acquainted myself with, but again, it's not something that you can quite grasp from a textbook, essentially. It is uh, so much more than that and I think from day one to the final day that we had together, um, each day it was almost like uh, doing a different spirit. If we were doing a different base, uh, like we did potato, we did barley and stuff, we did rice, 
Uh, each of those in and out of itself were so unique in the way that they produced them, whether they were done on a small scale or a large scale, uh, going down to the caves as well. Um, it's something that it speaks very true to the individual producer. So it is not something that you can just go, this is what Shochu is, uh, but you can kind of give an introduction as it is essentially like the spirit of the maker, the spirit of Japan. Like it's just, um, it's all about the Koji. So once you get that uh, 101 of um, what Koji does and what it does to your final product, um, I guess that is your elevator pitch. Just it's, it's, an, it's a spirit. It's made from a whole bunch of different non-grain, non-grain uh, base products, uh, and then you've got that little magic friend Koji, and they're doing its business, uh, and that's the one that's going to give you those amazing uh, depth and diversity of flavors. I could I couldn't agree more, and obviously that then means we have to explain Koji, but hopefully I'll do that very quickly and briefly now. The first records that we have anywhere in the world of some distilled spirit in Japan is something that a Portuguese explorer wrote in 1546. He mentioned something called Araki, right? Meaning some kind of a distilled spirit. And he was visiting the Kyushu region, which I like to call the Japanese Caribbean. It is the far Southwestern region of Japan. It's closer to Taiwan than Tokyo. Centres include Kagoshima, Miyako Island, and of course, Okinawa, the spiritual home of Awamori, the ancestor of Shochu. And on 1559, I love this story. This is the best story ever. The first written mention in Japan of Shochu was graffiti that was written on a shrine by workmen that had been hired to work on the shrine and they wrote graffiti on a Japanese shrine complaining that the prince, or sorry, the priest who hired them was so stingy that he wouldn't give them any shochu. So let that be a lesson to all of us to get your shochu needs defined in a contract if you get hired by a priest. But that was 1559. So what is it? As Jenna said, it is a Japanese distilled spirit. You can make it from barley, sweet potato, rice, sugar cane, but you can actually make it from about 20 different things. We'll come to that in a moment. The key thing is that it is sacrificed, meaning its starches are turned into sugar with both a mold called aspergillus, actually aspergillus oryzae, and yeast. The koji converts the starches into sugar and the yeast ferments those sugars into alcohol, but the koji also produces citric acid, which stops the whole mix getting infected by bacteria. Because, let's go back one, just for the hell of it. We're talking about tropical Japan here. It gets really, really hot. Maybe not as hot as Sydney right now, but pretty hot. Koji creates so much flavor. That's why if you've ever had miso soup or tasted soy sauce, you understand the kind of flavors that koji can create. Now, there's three types of shochu, and this is where a bit of whiskey knowledge comes in handy. There is pot still, single distilled shochu called honkaku. This was defined in 1971, and it is a pot still shochu bottled at less than 45% alcohol. There is a column still version called Korowai. And this has to be bottled at less than 36% alcohol. And if you blend the two together, you get a type of shochu called Koma. And if it has more Honkaku pot still than column still, it's called Otsurai Korowai Konwa Shochu. And if it has less, less than 49% of uh, pot still shochu, it's called Korowai Usurai Konwa. Honkaku Shochu has had a huge rise in popularity in Japan in the last 20 years when people realized that what they used to think was this blue collar drink is amazing. Now, you can age it in wooden barrels, but you can age it in ceramic pots, glass, or stainless steel. 
And within Japan, it's almost always bottled at around 25%. The Ichiko that Jenna used is quite unusual. It was actually created for the export market at 43%. Now, Awamori, which I mentioned, and I've actually got some here, is from the Ruku Islands. It's from Okinawa. And it's sort of the mezcal to shochu's tequila. It is single distilled, single ferment, black koji, Thai indica long grain rice, pot still shochu. And it's usually bottles in and around 40%. So it's, it's strong. There's no added sugar in shochu. There's no carbohydrates. So carrot, sesame, kelp, these are all shochu raw materials. Although to be honest, the sweet potato and barley account for about 80% of all the shochu that is made in Japan. The key, however, is the koji. So back in the day, there weren't all that many options. Yellow koji was used, but it didn't produce enough citric acid to fend off bacterial infection. Black koji arrived in Japan. No one's really sure from where. Might have been Korea. And in the 1920s, it was first noted that black koji had mutated into shira or white koji. White koji is very, very popular and common now in making shochu. It gives you lots of opportunities and delicacy. But the most important thing about koji is the depth of flavor that it creates. Let's go into that a little deeper. So there is a bit of koji growing. What happens is you get koji spores, Aspergillus oryzae spores, and you inoculate them on a host. Now it's usually rice, but it could be anything. You could put koji spores on sweet potato for a rice shoji, shochu, or you could put koji spores on rice for a sweet potato shochu, but very often it's rice. You inoculate the spores and then you let them grow in a room just like this one. This is a koji room. They're all growing in these boxes you can see. Then you take the koji out and you mix it up with a bit of yeast and a bit of water maybe, and you, they all go crazy. Fermenting, fermenting, propagating is the proper term. This is what's called the first maromi or the first fermentation. And when the koji and the yeast are all revved up and they're like, come at me, bro. Then you drop in your base ingredient. It could be sweet potato, barley, rice, sugar, whatever. And it goes to town, fermenting all of that into something alcoholic. Then it's time to distill it. Does that look like a pot still to you? It doesn't look like a pot still to me, but it is. You distill it in a pot still, if you're making Honkaku shochu, in a column still, if you're making uh, Kurawai shochu. These kind of stills were apparently copied from Canada in the 1950s, but there's many types of pot stills that are used in Japan. They're usually all stainless steel. Ah, oh my God, stainless steel. Yeah, that's how they roll in Japan. There's traditional ones. This looks more like something you'd find in Scotland. And there's also very traditional ones. This is a working cedar wood pot still. And then there's ones like this sucker. These are reduced pressure vacuum stills that were introduced to Japan in the 1950s. So if you think that rotovaps and vacuum distillation is new, uh-uh. These became really popular in Japan because they allow you to distill more delicately than is the case because they lower the atmospheric pressure so that the ethanol vaporizes at less than 78 degrees Celsius. After you've made it, you gotta store it. You can store it in stainless steel, as we have here. Stainless steel dates from 1913. Or ceramic, very popular, very traditional. Or, as Jenna mentioned, you could store it in a cave. Yes, in a cave. Down, 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 deep underground. There are thousands and thousands, maybe even millions of 1.8 liter bottles of shochu and awamori 
aging in the bottle. In fact, it's a tradition that you buy a 1.8 liter bottle of shochu or awamori when you have something happen in your life, a marriage, the birth of a baby, and the distillery will store it for you as long as you like. And you can come back after 20 years and take that bottle and maybe even drink it with that baby, which is amazing. Glass aging is nothing new. It happens with mezcal as well. It happens with vodka. It happens with certain eau de vies in Central Europe. It's really cool. Shochu in Japan will be served straight, of course, on the rocks with water, mizuari, with hot water, which is oh, amazing, oyawari. That was actually number two in our webinar series last week, or sorry, the week before, with uh, Odd and Alyssa in Norway, or sodawari. But there's also cocktails, and it's kind of what we're here for. So if you'd like to know more about shochu, follow JSS underscore shochu on Instagram. But it's time to go live to Sydney. Mike, how are you doing, brother? Very good, thank you, Phil. So uh, tell us what you're gonna make for us, mate. Okay, um, originally there was two cocktails that I made. Um, the one that I'm gonna make today is a super cool martini. Um, at the barber shop here in Sydney, we are predominantly a gin bar, so we make lots and lots of martinis. So, um, not to go down the road of the Sarkatini, but just do a slightly different spin uh, of what I think is a delicious martini. So, without further ado, I'll get into it, as time is of the essence. So, it's going to be a stirred martini. Okay, I'm going to use... Um, a soshu, a barley soshu from, oh sorry, there we go, so you can see it, uh, from Icky Island, which is 33%, and it's called Super Gold Soshu. Oh, that stuff's fantastic. There we go. Got it right over there. Yeah, it's delicious, which I'll talk you through a little bit more about that when, we, when I do a bit of a tasting. So, and then I'm going to use 30 mils. Kenobi gin. What gin is that, Mike? A Kenobi. I'll show you. Ah, Kenobi, of course. Yeah, go ahead. First Japanese gin, eh? Yeah. And then what we've done is um, a local distiller called Tim Stones. He used to work for Manly Spirits. We all know Tim. Yeah, Tim. So he's helped us with um, making a few distillates, which is native lemongrass, Australian native lemongrass, which is quite different different to uh, um, uh, Thai lemongrass. It's not quite as, as pungent in the lemon department. And it, originally it was a, um, it was used by the Aboriginals for colds and dare say it, uh, for chest infections, which we know all about at the moment. And then I used five mils of gelatin wax uh, distillate, which is, a native flower from South Australia. So I'm not going to be able to make this in New York, am I? No, I'm afraid not. No, I have to come <laughs> back to Sydney. <laughs> okay. So. And I used a little bit of green chartreuse to give it a little bit of depth and add some aniseed to it. Was this, was it, was it a bit of a 1980s martini in your mind, Mike, or uh... <laughs> No. <laughs> but I'll take it. Hey, those lychee martinis sold like Yeah, well, you know, that, that was when I was at my prime. <laughs> All downhill since then, mate. Oh, mate, I tell you. Luckily, we have Kellum to take over, the new generation. Right, okay. Yeah. And then beautiful frozen coupette. And then <laughs> and I know what it tastes like. So I'm gonna finish off with a little bit of baby's breath. Just drop in there to add a little bit of floral to it. So there we have it. There's a super cool martini. Cracker. So Mike, I wanted to ask you a question. 
obviously yeah. shochu it's new for most people it's new for you you know the trip to japan i think was an eye opener as as my trips always are and how does it change your sort of models of mixology you know and e even like down to naming cocktails well it's it's interesting it's kind of with the soshu it's not overly known here in australia um, it is a really new spirit that people are being introduced to um, it is a very versatile spirit and like what Jenna was saying and yourself about the flavors between you know the base base flavor versus the um, the koji as well have the influence of both and also the different types of base flavors that kind of you know generally barley is a mild flavor that doesn't have it still is the predominant flavor in this soshu so I think when it comes to making drinks and and really integrating it into you know the modern day cocktails i think it gives you more more character and and you know i just think that you can play with it a lot more i think even you know um we obviously use a lot of gin um which is you know manipulated by so many different botanicals these days and i think socio is so unique um so when it comes to mixing and, and creating cocktails i generally think it's a really interesting spirit to use yeah i mean anytime as an old bartender myself uh, when there's lots of flavor, you can make a great drink. That's why the hardest thing to mix with is vodka. And there's so much flavor in shochu and such variety. It gives you a lot of options, right? Yeah, definitely. And I think you don't, it, the, the hardest part that we found with um, creating cocktails was obviously the low ABV and, and not to overshadow it too much. Um, with this, I used the 33%. My last cocktail was 25%. The 25% was so delicate. Mm -hmm. um, compared to the 33. So I had to really balance it, you know, with, with what other ingredients I was using. And, and the last cocktail I did, which was a twist on a gimlet, which was, um, I used uh, native, native lime cordial, uh, finger lime cordial, sorry, uh, salt bush, and then uh, the 25% soju. I literally stirred that um, and then served it on a block of ice with some, you know, what is lime caviar. And it was so delicate and, and beautiful sweetness. It was, yeah, you kind of, you know, it really is a new category that needs to get properly explored. The, the hard amazing. part, I think, with, so, sorry? That's amazing though, isn't it? Yeah. I think the hard part with Soshu is that, you know, kind of knowing what is actually in it because a lot of the labels in Japanese. <laughs> so unless you've got a Japanese. You Oddly know. enough. <laughs> now that's something we're working on, believe it or not. Yeah. So uh, a couple more shout outs, Florian, Mika, Hideko, Miho, Yoshi, thanks for joining us, Asako, right? Uh, Callum, mate, we're gonna go live to you at the Duke of Clarence, that well-known shochu cocktail bar in Sydney. How are you doing, mate? Very good yourself, thank you. Good Cracker, so tell us what you're gonna make for us. All right, so I think uh, Gemma and Grace are really hit the nail on their head in terms of we're hitting in Australia hot weather, everyone's looking for that really light aperitivo style drink. So I've gone across that kind of flavor profile, but also using it as a quite delicate uh, ingredients to go along with uh, my particular soju. So I've gone from the Yaganata uh, Gita Distillery. Oh. Let's get real close in there. So this is aged in a Minzunara cask. So a very rare uh, sought after Japanese oak barrel for one to, two, uh, one to three years of aging. So it's very delicate, very light. It's got a lovely golden color, a bit of a butteriness to go with that, like umami flavors. Um, the drink I have gone with is uh, 30 mils of the sochu, a green tea cordial with a bit of citric acid. So it adds a bit of a bite there. So that green tea is gonna play nicely with the sochu with a nice little vegetal, but also that butteriness will come together. And you've got that bite from the citric acid. I've got some dry vermouth in there and uh, the dry vermouth was also then aged with uh, some dried raspberries. So you're getting a nice tartness coming through, but also it adds to the mouthfeel of the drink. Is so, that like, you know, frozen dried raspberries or what? Frozen dried, yeah. So we get them frozen dried. And so just similar to what Gemma did with her Davidson plums, it really does leach off the flavor allowing you to really better use the ingredients and not have so much waste. So I went for 30 mils of the soju, 10 mils of the uh, green tea cordial, 
and then only five mils of the dry vermouth just to really make it light and just really round out the body. And then everything is then stirred together and then topped up with just soda water. So adding it to a nice, delicate uh, flavor profile. So I'm just gonna get some large rocks in here. The whole idea behind the drink was trying to really just emphasize something that you could sip on and really just uh, play nicely with. So just stirring it down, it's then going to be served in a wine flute. Typically it would be chilled, but right now for the sake of demonstration, I haven't chilled it so that I can properly show you. There's a raspberry edible paint on the glassware. I can maybe get like a... It's bomb. inside, right? Yeah. So basically I've made a, a raspberry paint using some uh, pectin and some other flavor profiles to really balance it out. So that will slowly leach into the drink really creating another element as the drink uh, slowly uh, evolves. That's, that's so interesting. Because initially, it'll be chilled by the liquid, so nothing will happen, but eventually it'll start to melt, won't it? No, exactly. So it will eventually add color to the drink as well as uh, a slowly adaptive raspberry flavor. So the vermouth is quite delicate, but slowly this will get a bit more complexity coming through from it. And then you're left there with a nice, delicate hue, very gentle with the flavor profile, nothing too aggressive. And the soda plus the stirring down really brings out um, such a, this is a 41% uh, Honohai uh, soju. So it's quite full bodied in that nature. So a really nice way to you know balance it out, make it quite delicate. Oh, well done, mate. So uh, not a lot of people know that you actually came to Australia via uh, one of my favorite countries in the world, South Africa, which is the best country in the world to live in if you have a gun. Um, moving to Australia, right? Having lived in Joburg, which is this beautiful, big, sprawling metropolis, I love it. Um, what do you think the difference is mixing and making and selling cocktails in small cities versus big ones? Uh, uh, first up would definitely be the acceptance from your uh, guests of experimental and new flavors. I mean, going to so you can go to certain small towns and you can get an old fashioned guaranteed safely, but they wouldn't have anything that's too high concept. And sometimes you may not want to be really enjoying that when you're on a holiday somewhere out west of the country. While there are bars offering that, but in the city, especially where we are, uh, Duke of Clarence and the barbershop, there's a lot of people walking around looking for that new experience, that new flavor to hit. And that's why I think Sochi would be, you know, something new for the Aussie palate that we're, we're just not accustomed to yet. Well, where you're located, I mean, for anybody who doesn't know, it's not all that easy to find uh, no. where Kellum works. It's, you know, hidden down an alleyway. So therefore, the people that walk in, they want to be there. No one's just coming in to use the loo. I mean, occasionally, obviously, but. No, but the last thing, so being like in that, like that very easy, speakeasy kind of uh, aesthetic does play well and nicely, a lot, especially with a lot of bars in the area where, you know, we're not trying to, you know, come up with something too high octane. It's really come in, good drinks, good service, while still, you know, showing off a new product. I couldn't agree more. Well, Kellum, Mike, thanks lads. It's time to move to one of your good mates, none other than uh, Australia's man in Singapore, the honorary consul himself, David May and Lou. David, how you doing, mate? Good, mate, good, mate. How are you? Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Oops. You've muted yourself, Philip. Okay, there we go. Yeah, Probably go. lots of people think that I should be muted on a regular basis. They're not wrong, but... Yeah. <laughs> We've been making cocktails on, it seems like, a load of Zoom calls lately, David. But uh, yeah. what have you got for us today? Uh, look, I've got, a, I've got a couple, but uh, I'll do the first one. Uh, uh, when we went to uh, Japan last year and tried a few of the uh, high proof shoju, I was really quite inspired. And I, the first thing I thought was that it would work so well with uh, martinis. Um, so the first cocktail I'll do, and I'll just get everything ready actually, because uh, I was quite rushed around two seconds. Here's something I prepared earlier, there you go. Um, so 
This is a martini style drink. Um, it's a 50-50 style. I, I really love 50-50 martinis. They're, they're just uh, absolutely delightful to drink. And what I've done is uh, I've got a, a watermelon infused dry vermouth here. So as, it, as I've just said, it is 50-50. Uh, so we're going equal shochu and uh, dry vermouth. So just uh, chop up show. a bit of watermelon with the dry vermouth for a day or two? Yeah, look, I just let it in, uh, in a cold infuse in the fridge over a day. Uh, and it just came out perfect, really. Uh, you didn't have to do too much to it. The shochu I'm using, uh, I don't know if you guys have seen this before. This is uh, the SG shochu. So this is uh, from our good friend Shingo over in Japan, who uh, looks after the SG club. He's also... Uh, and uh, Steve, they've also got you know, the, the Speed Glow group uh, over in China as well. But this is an absolutely delightful uh, shochu. It's rice-based shochu. It's 40%. Uh, SG itself, it's got three different varieties. It's got the sweet potato, it's got the barley, and this one. And the reason why I thought this works so well with it, uh, it holds up. Uh, it sits so perfectly together. Uh, what I found here in Singapore is that a lot of people, you know, working, working in Manhattan for a while, uh, there weren't uh, too many 50-50 drinkers or, and what you'd have to do is kind of put them onto it. So one of the drinks I actually put onto the, my first Manhattan menu was a 50-50 martini style and people absolutely loved it. So this one, I've got the two there and what I've also got to, to uh, add a little complexity to it is this is a toasted sesame tincture. So this one, I've actually toasted off uh, some sesame seeds, and then I've actually let it infuse with some of the, the shochu itself. Uh, give me a second while I'm gonna grab a little bit of ice down here. Here's my little thing. Yeah, I just found that you don't have to steer away too much if you've got some uh, good quality shochu. You know, I think the shochu, I like said 40% uh, alcohol, this one really holds up well in a martini. Uh, and even if you were to go, you know, uh, a 5 to 2 ratio or 6 to 1 ratio, it really, really works quite well. Uh, I think the first time that I actually made this one, I I smashed it in about two sips. So, you know, <laughs> it was a great, great little, uh, little no better recommendation. And yeah. And you know what? And, you know, uh, my wife, every time I make cocktails at home, she's, she's a taste tester and she actually absolutely smashed it all. So, and then I just finish it off with a, a little bit of uh, watermelon in there. So, that is a sexy there. looking drink, David. Yeah. So look, you know, as I said, this, I love 50-50 martinis and I found this works really well. Uh, you know, I, I did play around with a few different style shochus. You know, shochu uh, <clears throat> isn't overly huge in Singapore, uh, but it is known across Asia region as well. Uh, and, you know, I tried it with the barley shochu, I tried it with the sweet potato. It all works so well and we do have, you know, as I said, it's not too well known, but there is a, a good variety of shochus that uh, I can pop down the shop to um, and purchase some, which is great. Yeah. So this one, this one like, from the David. I know you've travelled all around the region, and you've gone from a mega high-profile job in Sydney to a mega high-profile one in Singapore. What are the major differences in making cocktails in those two markets? Uh, I think. I think coming to Singapore, the, the biggest difference that I found was uh, a lot of a, a lot of spirit forward drinks here. Um, you know, uh, coming from Australia, we were so we were so spoiled for choice in terms of the freshest uh, fruit and vegetable and produce that you can get. You know, um, a, you know, we get some great produce here as well, but a lot of it is imported. Um, you know, so yeah, there's no bulletin place in Singapore. No, no, no. That's the thing. 
Um, so uh, a lot of the cocktail bars, and I'd say, you know, a, a lot uh, of the cocktail bars here have rotavaps and, you know, they, they create their own flavors. So there's a, there's a big, big difference here. And uh, when, I, when I moved over here and tried to put a bit of my influence around with, uh, on the menu, you know, we, we, I tried to bring a, a bit of a lighter style side to it and have that little Aussie influence. You know, even this martini itself, like uh, you guys over there in Sydney, uh, in Australia, you're going through a heat wave. I mean, Singapore's 30, 35 degrees every day. And, you know, I love to just have something nice and refreshing. And obviously this martini is just a, a nice uh, alternative to that too, you know. So you can, you can literally, literally just smash this. You know, it's, it still sits up so well. Um, but that to toasted sesame tincture just finishes off really well. Oh, brilliant. Fantastic. And remember, we'll have all those recipes in uh, the next week or so on the JSS underscore Shochu Instagram account. By the magic of Zoom, we're going live to David's mate and colleague, former colleague at uh, Manhattan, Alson. Alson, how are you doing, mate? Well, it's good, man. So far, Singapore has been great. Uh, been really, uh, I think we kind of adapted to this situation really well in Singapore. So, so far, I think I'm pretty blessed to be man. So I'll move on to the cocktail itself. Brilliant, mate. So uh, <laughs> what do you want to make for us? What show are you using? Let it roll. We're using uh, a Goku Raku from Kumamoto. So it's a rice-based sochu, high on ABV with 40%. So the ingredients I lined up is actually things that I always uh, have in my daily routine. So. I mean, my mom always makes uh, honey lemon in the morning for me because she believes it's a good way to start the day, right? Something just to wake me up. So the name of this cocktail is going to be uh, Daybreak. So I'm going to start with like 5 ml of honey water. It's just like a hangover cocktail, Alison. <laughs> I know. It works though. <laughs> And uh, we're going to do like two, dash, three dashes of uh, lemon bitters, actually. So what I did was actually um, I infused cookie Americano with uh, black tea, just to bring up the earthy notes coming from the sochu itself, because I really uh, enjoy uh, drinks with uh, good earth notes, actually. So it's 20 ml. Mm -hmm. And then the last, the last ingredient will be 50 ml of the soju itself. So this is going to be like a Manhattan style drink. We want to put any citrus in this drink actually, just to not overshadow the flavors coming from the soju. So it's clear you wanted this to be a Manhattan cocktail style drink. And it kind of demands that higher strength shochu, doesn't it? Yes. So that's the reason why I chose a higher proof uh, shochu to, play, to go for this cocktail. So I'll finish off with the just a lemon zest garnish. And then I'll just drop in it. Something Brilliant. Citrus and, um, I think it's good to uh, people who really enjoy sochu itself because this one really highlights the, the character coming from the sochu. Uh, we can do without the lemon bitters. Lemon bitters is just uh, something just to really bring out the lemon flavors. But besides that, I think the three ingredients is really good enough to stand alone. Something uh, not too, not too, not too uh, tedious to make as well. Yeah. And I think I got a question for you, and it's good you have a drink in front of you because it's a hard question. What's the biggest adjustment you've had to make in this crazy COVID year that is 2020? Um, okay, I believe that the, so far, I mean, when COVID hit Singapore, uh, definitely affected almost everyone. Uh, bars had to close down because we couldn't really open. I think the team uh, in Manhattan really stood together, really kind of support each other, regardless of the situation that we were in. So, 
and even uh, hotel uh, the hotel management was really versatile, really flexible how they actually uh, delegate uh, different duties for us. So we started doing more of the bottle cocktails, doing deliveries to homes instead of just uh, doing other. I mean, since the bar is not open, we just bring the bar to them. Why not? So we just kind of bottle cocktails and just really just trying to push uh, sales online instead. So we can, it kind of like open up our eyes to the e-commerce scene in Singapore. Uh, so definitely, we learned, we learned more things actually through COVID, how to really uh, readjust our direction in the business. Yeah, I think most of us wouldn't want to have to learn the lessons, but to me, adaptability, the theme of this show to seminar is the theme of 2020. And I think it will be the theme of 2021. It's sort of like this world changing thing we've all gone through. And it's going to be totally normal for every bar to have delivery cocktails from now on. Like, are you doing anything like that at the Duke, Kellum? No, absolutely. We were doing all of our signatures during the shutdown for Sydney because we were very, we all going to remodel to basically have our Sunday roasts paired with our cocktails for delivery. So that was a, a nice little change for us. I mean, it's mad. Like the idea of delivery cocktails was this weird thing. Like what about at Picaleo, uh, Gracie? Do you do anything like that there? Um, I only recently just started. I was at Shady Pines until uh, as lockdown hit. Um, we didn't, we never did anything like that, but I definitely ordered them. <laughs> and drank them, which was good because, you know, I think it was great to be able to support some of my favorite bars like PS40 and drink their drinks, but from the comfort of my couch, <laughs> which is something that I continue, hope continues to 100%. be a set, I think. Now there's something magical about getting cocktails delivered at home. And <laughs> some bars do it better than others. There's bars here uh, that will actually deliver the cocktail, the garnish, and the ice as well, which is like next level. Well, like good... Mikey, are you doing that from the barber shop as well, same as the Duke? Um, you know what, um, we were, but like we're kind of almost. Uh, we're about, you know, nearly sixty-five percent full swing here. You know, we're kind of we're we're still restricted by numbers, so the bottle cocktails kind of fell off the earth. You know, as soon as you could let 10 people in, people were keen to go out again and, and get amongst it. Um, Cantina OK have probably championed um, the takeaway cocktail in terms of if you're in a queue, you can have one. <laughs> They're only allowed six people, but they've got like 30 people in a queue on a Friday night all drinking takeaway cocktails. <laughs> Brilliant. So they've been very smart how they've done it, and I think they even confused the police. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a curfew here. Your um, the bars, yeah. restaurants, everything have to close at ten o'clock. So, yeah. bottled and canned cocktails are very useful. You can say to people, "Hey, sorry guys, we've got clothes, but do you want to buy like six of these little cans or six of these cocktails? Then you can go home and keep the party going." Yeah, yeah, and we do that as well. If people don't, if, if, you know, we have bookings, so if they don't reach the minimum spend then they get to take away with them the value of that in a cocktail, a beer, a, a bottle of gin, whatever it may be. So, you know, we have adapted and that kind of stuff. You know, we've had to, you know, like everyone else. I, I do think it'll stick around forever. And, you know, we're actually working on our takeaway program at the moment, again, to really give it another big push, um, which will be in the new year. Now, I think what's going to come out of this is there's going to be people who think to themselves, I'm not going to go downtown, you know, shave my legs, queue up, all that <laughs> shit on a Friday. I'm just going to stay home, right? I'm going to order their cocktails. I'm going to have my Spotify list, you know, and they might yeah. go out on a Monday or a Tuesday. I don't know how it is in Sydney or yeah. even Singapore, but my mates in London, they've noticed they're quieter on Friday, Saturday. They're busier on Monday, Tuesday, because people know it won't be as packed. Yeah, like, time has no meaning anymore. Like the day of the week is like of no significance anymore. It's just, will it be busy? 
probably. I think, I think, uh, I think in Singapore here, you know, Sundays, Sundays used to be very quiet. Uh, a lot of bars used to shut on Sundays, actually. So only the hotel bars would be open on a Sunday. But now with the, the restrictions here, a lot more bars have opened up on a Sunday and Sundays are absolutely packed in a lot of the bars. You know? um, and we, we've still got the restriction here where we only can only have five, uh, five people per table. And you know, we've got to, you've got to close by 10.30. So most places do a 9.30 last call. So yeah, look, at any night of the week, you know, you, I think it's changed so much that people have to make a reservation when they go out. Because yeah. you can't literally, you cannot literally just walk into a bar uh, because of the restrictions anymore. You, you actually have to, you know, make a reservation. So, you know, even, even tonight, I'm like, it's Monday night, but I'm going out tonight, that's for sure. So I've got a 7.30 re reservation at Atlas tonight. So, yeah. Well, I mean, everyone, has everybody become a bartender now? You only go out on Monday, Tuesday. You don't go out <laughs> Friday, Saturday. You make sure there's a place for you. It's yeah. too. It's so. It's so busy, isn't it? Uh, like I said, Friday, Saturdays, you will be very hard for us to get a table. Uh, it's like, it's like trying to get a reservation at your favourite restaurant. And you've got to book a few weeks ahead. Uh, you've got to really prepare yourself when you go out on a, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, here in Singapore. I think, you know, I think, uh, I think there was an event at uh, at Jigger and Pony that I went to a couple of weeks ago, and. Uh, it was two weeks ahead that they announced the event, but within 24 hours they were booked out. So, you know, and that, that event was on a Sunday afternoon, like a Sunday evening. So, you know, these, right. these guys were booked, completely booked out on a Sunday. I mean, here in New York, even uh, the Dead Rabbit is doing Irish coffees and pints of Guinness to go. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Genius. Dangerous. <laughs> it's dangerous. It's actually, you know, I, I was at a pub the other day and, and this pub down the road, um, they were doing five litre flask of Guinness takeaway. <laughs> so... Five. <laughs> What's that? Respect. It's the war country. It wasn't, yeah, it wasn't, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't a keg. It was literally like a, a flask that big. <laughs> Wow. Right, we're doing that, Kellen. Yeah, done. Let's, we'll get a couple of flagons in, we'll go. <laughs> you guys do that? <laughs> but that's five that's litres, the Duke of uh, staff day out. Five <laughs> litres of Guinness. <laughs> and a bottle of shochu. Why not? Lovely. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. So a server pot. Nah, brilliant. So, uh, Jenna, what's the vibe in Sydney at the moment? I mean, we around the world, we've seen that Australia was doing really well. Then there was that flare up in Melbourne. Then it's really well. Then this idiot in the pizza parlor. But has it been affected <laughs> by a lack of tourism, a lack of business travel? People are begging for any excuse to go out. Like it's, um, I w actually was down in Melbourne this time last week when they just opened the borders from New South Wales to Victoria mm -hmm. as um, they were in serious, serious lockdown. Uh, and just the stark contrast that a one hour flight can make uh, here in Sydney, we're pretty much, yeah, as you guys are saying, almost back out to out of the woods normality-ish or new normal, whatever that's gonna be. Um, yeah, with social distancing and stuff, that's um, being relaxed a little bit tomorrow. I think, um, yes. yeah, so it, it's just a little bit more freedom as people are still cautious and aware, but um, again, going down to Melbourne, which has much stricter uh, restrictions at the moment, uh, people are only just starting to be able to go out at all. Uh, and the, it's, it's kind of where we were um, maybe six months ago, all over again for them. So. Um, I think they deserve a drink more than anyone else. So I'll be able to go up and catch up with friends and everything. So uh, I think it's affected them. It's very much state to state. Uh, but here in Sydney, it seems everyone's still 
more than happy to do all the protocol that you need to do, sign in, make sure you're sitting down and stuff like that, uh, just in order to be able to, as we said, support other people's businesses, which have been so badly affected. Uh, and to be able to have that social interaction that has been, you know, not talking to people through a screen for the last mm -hmm. six months, which has been, you know, it does, it does things to a person. So it's, uh, it's nice to actually be able to go out and try to start again and see the light at the end of the tunnel. I couldn't agree more. Well, this has been a fantastic session. I want to thank uh, you, Jenna and Gracie, Mike and Kellum, also in Sydney, Alison and David in Singapore, and everyone who's tuned in. Cheers, Mika and Hideko and Yoshi and everybody else. We're going to do all this again in two weeks with an even more stellar crew of international bartenders. And all of these sessions in an edited version are going to be on the Instagram TV of JSS underscore show you on Instagram. So when you have questions, we're here for you. If you fancy tuning in, we're going to do this again. I want to say thank you to everybody who made the effort. Thank you to all my mates here who've been to Japan with me. One of these days, we're going to go back to Japan. And let's not forget, they're still hardcore to hold the Olympics next year. Japan doesn't play. Everybody, thank you so much. Thank Everybody. you. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Cheers. Cheers.